I have successfully made contact with the Prime Minister of Camino, and behind me is an SF-90. <laughs> anyway, hello guys, as you can tell I'm a massive Star Wars fan. It's raining, as it always is raining in the UK, that's why I've got my hood up. I'm not being an antisocial brat. But behind me, I have this wonderful spaceship, or um, A-Wing, that, see, Star Wars reference, I, I tied those two in together. Um, Ferrari SF90 and today I'm going to talk about why this car got so much hate and why I think it's one of the most underrated Ferraris of all time uh, Also, people tend to not like how it looks, but for some reason it's been getting more and more appreciated uh, the, the more we go into time. So hopefully one day people will look back on this and realize the beauty that is the Ferrari SF90 I'm going to quickly go over the styling of the SF90 and some things people didn't like about it. The new uh, light design, people not really fans of. Um, I don't know why, I think it looks modern and futuristic. People said they look too much like the F8 Tributo, but when I look at the two cars, I'm like, look, I'm gonna do a side by side here, watch movie magic. F8 Tributo, Ferrari SF90. They don't look anything alike. Well, apart from the modern design and the black roof, uh, uh, anyway. The lighting design is cool. Um, I like these three lines here. It's got this weird fin here that on the Assetto Furiano pack made this section uh, a different color to the body of the car. And I think that also didn't help people's opinions of the car because it was so radical and so different. Since Ferrari left Pininfarina, um, this is one of the first cars that they produced. Uh, again, carking a lot of controversy. I think it's a beautiful looking car. It has some goofy elements like the mirrors, I'm not sure if you noticed them, I wrapped them black for this reason, but they're extremely wide. Um, the car doesn't go in my garage with the mirrors out, yet my SVJ, which is a wider car, goes into the garage with the mirrors out. Um, I don't know, they look like big ears attached to the side of the car. Um, they came with black roofs as well, I think, to hide the bubble roof. If you see a colour matched roof on an SF90, it looks very strange, but in black, I think it looks a certain level of je ne sais quoi. Um, if we take a look at the side profile, it keeps the traditional Ferrari design language of having this big panel here. But it just looks kind of unfinished, which I understand. But again, it's a car that you have to let grow on you. And also this is a new design language for Ferrari. It's not the same old, same old that we've got in the past. They're just trying to take a step into the future. And this was their first look, their first glimpse into the future of Ferrari. Um, I think it's an amazing looking car. I think it works well. The most controversial part of the design for me was round here at the back. Funny, I say round here at the back, but if you look back here, the, the, the rear lights are no longer round and that is something that Ferrari have always done and it's a beautiful feature. The A12 Superfast arguably had some of the best um, rear lights that I've ever seen on a Ferrari and then they made them like little squares and I don't think it looks that great. Uh, I think they've tried to redeem it with a Ferrari SF90XX making them thin lines and then putting a light bar, but this could have been better. Uh, but yeah, the Ferrari uh, SF90, to me, I think it's a great looking car, but I just think people saw this and thought, wow, this is a very strange looking Ferrari. Uh, fun fact, I was uh, driving once with my wife in the car. We saw a Ferrari SF90. She saw it, this was before we had one. She saw it and she said, is that a Honda? I assume she got it confused with the Honda NSX. To me, it doesn't look anything like a Honda, but I understand the design language is just a lot more flowy than we're used to from Ferrari. And if you come over here and take a look into here, we have the heart of the Ferrari SF90, the twin turbocharged V8. It's a 90 degree V, so it can sit very low to reduce the center of gravity in the car. And it's also accompanied by three electric motors and one battery. So um, we'll get to that in a minute. But again, like I said, it's raining. So let's jump in. We'll go on a little cruise and then I'll tell you about why I really like this car and why some of you guys didn't. I, again, I feel like people are starting to like this car. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna take the, the glory for that. <laughs> Uh, camera, cameraman Lou said, let's, let's film the startup. And I said, Lou, man, it's, the car's already on. It's a hybrid. It makes little space Jetson sounds. So if I go up close to it, the mic should have picked it up. I think they might have picked it up. It, it literally sounds like the Starship, Star, Starship Enterprise? Starship Alliance? Starship Enterprise. Um, oh yeah, another fun fact about the SF90. Look at the door. Look how much it doesn't open. That's the max. So you have to get in like... This seat's all the way back, by the way. Yep, it was all the way back. That wasn't easy. But uh, I'll do an engine startup now. So to start SF90, you have to put the engine into performance mode or qualify it. I'm going to go into performance. As you can tell, there was no starter motor because the electric motor actually spins the crank and gets the engine going. So you don't get the ch -ch 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 sound. So it takes a bit of the emotion out of here, but again, 
This is the future we subscribed to. So currently driving the SF90, it's a, again, wet, miserable day. Um, number one factor of why I think uh, the SF90 probably didn't do well, well, this is number one, but the first factor I'm gonna talk about. If you were going to test drive this car, or if you've bought this car, and you live, for example, in the UK, the car comes standard with Cup 2 tires. In the UK, it's raining like literally 70% of the time. Um, although this car has four wheel drive, Cup 2 tires just do not provide grip. Four wheel drive will not save you from uh, mere physics. So it means that in conditions like this, the car is very skittish and you have to drive it in wet mode. And when you drive the car in wet mode, it's even less engaging. And that is because in wet mode, the car disengages the front roll bar to improve comfort. So um, the car has something called bumpy road mode. You press a button, the anti-roll bars disengage, and then the car's suspension can move independently of one another. So in wet mode, you're just stuck like that. So it's quite weighty, it's not direct. It feels super, super disengaged. And then the four-wheel steering system gets a bit overexcited as well in wet mode, where it's just eager to turn in. I mean, I get why it's like that, because if you live in a sunny country, you're probably never gonna be in wet mode, but in the UK or in Europe, I think you'll kind of struggle to really understand and experience this car. I mean, I've had the luck to um, have this car for over a year now, so I've experienced it in all conditions. When you're in sport or in even better race mode, in hot weather, the car is stupendous, it's incredible. Um, but in wet mode, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like the Ferrari you expect it to be. It doesn't feel like a performance car. The SF90, to me, is very different to what other Ferraris are. I think it also hurts that the last, like, Ferrari to come out before this, the mid-engine Super Ferrari, was the uh, 488 Pista, because people were probably just thinking, oh, wow, it's gonna be like the Pista, and I'm gonna swap my Pista for an SF90. Oh, a thousand horsepower, it's gonna be incredible. And they probably got an SF90 and thought, oh, this is quite tame, it's quite easy to drive, it's not scary at all. A thousand horsepower doesn't feel that intimidating, it doesn't feel racy. And I think Ferrari have changed their mentality when it comes to designing their cars. I think this car is more akin to a 911 Turbo S than it is uh, to like a 488 Pista. It's just trying to get, okay, the maximum performance, we're not caring about emotion, we're not caring about vibe, we're not caring about all that stuff. We just want it to just go and go well. Uh, and that's what it does. I mean, like you put your foot down, this car will go apart from when it's wet like this. Um, foot down, it will go, it will perform on the track. It's not gonna give you that thrilling experience that you get from, again, a rear wheel drive Pista or even like an F8. It's gonna be a bit more tame just because it's chasing that perfect lap time. Uh, you may not have an issue with that, some people may do. I think it's good for this car because it makes this car more of like a Grand Tourer. But that brings me on to another reason why this car struggled. The Ferrari SF90 would be an amazing touring car. Again, it's super comfortable to drive, amazingly comfortable. The suspension dampening is great in this car. It kind of rolls into corners, which allows weight distribution. It just means that you have like quite a confident drive, but it means that you have a quite a relaxed drive when you want to be switched off. You also have these comfortable seats, again, headroom, legroom storage space behind you, you have a glove box that many cars don't have nowadays. But the only thing is that, let's say you wanna go and stay away for the weekend. You and your wife wanna go take a romantic hotel getaway. Let me show you something. So, the front storage section, it looks like it will be massive. However, you will be deceived because when you open it, you have enough space for license plates, maybe a laptop and half of a duffel bag. But you do get this wonderful display that says Racky, Race E, R-A-C-E, which shows the inverter for the electric powertrain um, and the front wheels, uh, because there's two motors on the front axles, uh, the space is just taken up. So unfortunately, uh, if you do want to have a romantic getaway with your wife, you're pretty much bringing nothing but underwear, which is a shame. Because this car is so good at doing like the cruising stuff, I like to take it on dates when I go with my wife. It's immaculate at doing that kind of thing, but we can't never take it for like away trips or going away, which is really frustrating. And I just wish that we could, um, but the Rivalto has front storage space, so we can put stuff in there. So we'll be using that. But this is just so much of a like sleek date night car. Um, oh, you also get the plaque there that shows all the options you have in the car. I love this car and it's a shame that it didn't do well or wasn't a success, I should say. 
I think people are just apprehensive of new technologies, new design language. And when people heard 1000 horsepower, they assumed it was going to be like the next La Ferrari, but it's like mass production kind of Ferrari that wasn't limited numbers. There aren't many around because again, not many people order them. And I personally think people are missing out. Aside from the lack of storage space, the incredibly difficult doors to enter and the constant errors that this car tends to have. You, you heard the car unlock, right? So why did the alarm go off? It's definitely unlocked. Yeah, so this car um, had a few errors um, and people didn't realize you had to keep it on charge in order to uh, make sure the car works. So the hybrid powertrain is actually also the trigger charger. So the battery for the hybrid powertrains, once you plug it in and that's charged, it, it gives battery uh, life or power to the 12 volt battery in the front wheel well. And if you don't keep it on charge, your battery's just gonna die. So uh, people had a lot of issues with that. And obviously new technology, new software is quite buggy. It was quite buggy, but it's received updates since then. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a shame, it's a shame. I think people will look back on this car and think, wow, a thousand horsepower and anyone could buy it. Well, if you had money, it was very expensive as well, which is also an issue. Um, so this car in the UK fully optioned for a uh, coupe version or Stradal, that you call it. Um, you're probably looking at about over 450,000 pounds for a decently optioned one, which is insane. Um, and it's even worse when you realize that on uh, the used market, they dropped to about 350,000 pounds. So um, you can pick a SF90 up today from Ferrari for about 350. I think it's a bargain. I don't think they're gonna drop much more than that. Um, but if they do, my bad. Um, listen, I'm just here to give you the vibes, not financial advice. So currently on a twisty road, it's wet, so I'm not going to drive very fast. But I was just explaining that the traction system is so good in this car. There's not behind me. I'll, I'll floor it in wet mode and you'll see how behaved and composed it is. Remember, I'm on cup two tyres, which are basically slicks. Traction light was flashing for a while, but that was zero to 60 quicker than other cars would do zero to 60 in the dry. So yeah, that is stupendous to drive. Oh my God, there's a big puddle. It's not like the busiest road in the world. So currently I'm actually quite low on fuel. So I'm gonna put the car over into electric mode because I, in this car, have 15 miles of electric range. So that means that you can uh, creep to your destination in absolute silence and bliss, which is convenient, especially compared to like the newer Lamborghini Rivolto, which has like five miles of electric range. But again, I feel like if you're a traditionalist, a Ferrari enthusiast, you're gonna probably think of this as another thing, taking it further from your ideal Ferrari um, idea in your head. Uh, the car has a confusing amount of driving modes. So you have your Manatino switch on your right, which you have wet, sport, race, um, CT off, and then ESC off, which is completely everything off. Uh, those just control the internal combustor engine and the suspension setup of the car, so increasing the spring rate and the dampening. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have the electric Manatino, as they call it, which has um, e-drive, hybrid, performance, and qualifying. So basically, e-drive is electric only, hybrid, the car will switch between um, internal combustion and the electric powertrain in order to get you the most efficient driving experience possible. Uh, performance mode, it will use mainly internal combustion engine, but it will allow the um, hybrid powertrain to drip feed energy into the powertrain for when you're like flooring it or when you're just cruising on the motorway. It will add additional e-drive performance. And then you have um, qualifying mode, which is a balls out to 1000 horsepower, unlimited uh, perfection. And it will recharge the battery as fast as possible. It's supposed to be used for when you're doing like one hot lap, but I occasionally just drive with it when I'm on the motorway just because it makes the car as fast as possible. The interior of the SF90 is super overwhelming. I was literally just saying to Lou behind the camera that when I first picked it up, I was um, very much confused because there's so much going on. Again, the touch buttons are just numerous and they do so many different things. Start the engine, turn off the engine, electric mode. And then you have this to switch your drivetrain mode to do your um, wipers, you have another knob and twisty thing. Then to flash the high beams, you have this. There's a lot going on. And because they're all haptic touch, it means you have to look down at them in order to press them. You can't just like remember where they are and just click them apart from like this one switch here. Even to start the engine of the car is a touch button. All the air conditioning is done through touch. Adjusting your mirrors is done through touch. If your passenger wants to do anything, that's also done through touch, thanks to this wonderful passenger display. It's a very strangely sized screen. Um, and fun fact, you can actually get your navigation up on there, which is weird. I'm not gonna do that right now, but 
yeah, uh, they can see your performance and other things. It's just very, very modern. And I think the jump might have been too drastic for current Ferrari customers, where it went from being, oh, quite analog, quite simple, to the other extreme, where it's just everything's digital, everything's hyper-modern. I feel like this car should have probably just merged the two together and then we go, went to the fully futuristic one, maybe in like three, four years from now. Um, also, you have this weird... Um, Thing. This got criticised when the car launched. This is to select your uh, drive mode or your gears. So you can have automatic manual launch and then there's reverse. Um, it's supposed to pay homage to the old gated manual shifters in Ferraris. People thought it was corny, but I think now everyone just stops caring. Similar to the front of the BMW M3 and M4s. Like, everyone was insulting it at first, but then everyone just, like, stopped caring. Which was kind of weird. You've got this curved or convex um, windscreen in front of you. Great visibility out the side. The mirrors is quite terrible because they're just a really weird angle. So you can't really see what's behind you. Um, and speaking of behind you, you can kind of see it out there. Ferrari care about people being able to see what's behind them. So um, they've divided the rear section so you can see into the engine bay and you can also see behind you, which is a nice and convenient thing. You can also see the spoiler move. So it moves under hard braking or when you get to really high speeds. Not that I've been to on really high speeds, but yeah. It's a shame that people don't like it. I understand why people didn't like it. It was just very different. But I personally would take an SF90 over an F8 Tributo. Uh, I would take an SF90 over many cars. Um, think of it less like, okay, I want this to be like a 488 Pista or I want it to be like a LaFerrari and think more of 911 Turbo. That's what this car is competing with. Even though it costs almost twice as much or more than twice as much as a, a 911 Turbo S, it gives you, um, I don't know, twice as much of the excitement, I guess, I, I would say. Yeah, I don't know. It's a shame. I might sell mine, guys, because the Rualto is here, but I just wanted to give you a last hurrah of why I think this car is amazing. I don't want to sell it because I love it so much, but we'll see what happens. But yeah, that's the SF90, and this is this week's episode. Again, apologies, it's raining. But if you want to see something more interesting, look at the previous videos on my channel. I've got one where uh, GT3 RS, doing a little GT3 RS fun moment with that, and a bunch on the Rualto, and the M3 Touring. We've got some more stuff coming. I've got a new car coming next week, hopefully. So uh, look out for that. Not new as in I'll own, but new as in a new car to do a video on. Anyway, enjoy. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And tell me, do you think I should sell this car? Do you think I should keep it? And please don't say, oh, keep it and sell the Rualto. I'm not selling the Rualto. But I think, I feel like I should keep it. I wanted to do a giveaway on it, actually. So I was going to do a giveaway and give all the profits to charity. So basically do like a raffle, raffle the car off so I can win the car. And any profits I make on top of that, give it to charity. So I could do that instead. So I don't know. Should I do a giveaway or should I do a raffle? No, they're the same thing. Should I do a giveaway or should I keep it? I don't know. Again, it's raining. Um, I had surgery yesterday or day before yesterday. So I'm really like not in the best of conditions right now, but I hope you enjoyed. Ah, oh, my leg. Hope you enjoyed, SF90. Oh yeah, again, it's wrapped in a wonderful bluish, goldish color. Ta-ra for now, guys. That's enough. Lock the SF90.